I've asked many Christians, have you heard a sermon based on Saul's name being changed to Paul? Almost everyone who I've asked has said, yes, I have. This is because thousands of Christian sermons have been based on or include this trope to make a point about personal transformation. In this video, I will show you that Paul's name never changed. As was common in the Roman world, he had multiple names. One in his native language, his being Hebrew or Aramaic, Saul or Shaul, and another in the language of the empire, Greek or Latin, his name being Paul. World famous pastor John MacArthur provides a highly viewed example of the name change trope. And as we come into the ninth chapter of Acts, Acts chapter 9, we come to one of the great days in the history of the world, the conversion of a man named Saul, whose name was eventually changed to Paul. So great was the transformation that it apparently needed to be reflected in his name. And so we are told in chapter 13, verse 9, that his name was changed to Paul. I'm going to demonstrate that Saul's name was not changed by first showing you what name changes in Scripture actually look like. Second, I will read portions of Acts 9 and Acts 13 to show that Saul's name was not changed to Paul. Third, I will show examples of other figures in the Bible who also go by multiple names, as was common when living in non-Jewish empires. The name change trope should be avoided not only because it is biblically inaccurate, but also because it reinforces an untrue historical picture of Paul that can perpetuate notions of anti-Judaism. When people say that Saul became Paul, it is often shorthand for Paul undergoing a dramatic conversion from being a Jew to being a Christian. He abandoned legalistic and harsh Judaism for Christianity. Saul, the violent Pharisee, became Paul, the peaceful Christian. Addressing the name change trope is a step toward addressing Christian anti-Judaism and correcting a historical inaccuracy about Paul. Luckily, there are many good Christian responses to the name change trope that I will link in the description, but the name change trope is still really prevalent today, as we saw with Pastor John MacArthur, so let's respond. There are well-known examples of name changes throughout the Bible, so let's take a look at what it looks like when God changes someone's name, starting with Abram so that we know what we should expect when we reach Paul's encounter with Yeshua in Acts 9 and the idea of his name changing in Acts 13. Genesis 17, 3-5 says, Abram threw himself on his face, and God spoke to him further. As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the father of a multitude of nations. You shall no longer be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I make you the father of a multitude of nations. Notice, God explicitly says, You shall no longer be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. God never again calls him Abram throughout the rest of Scripture from this point forward. The name Abram is used in a genealogy in 1 Chronicles 1-2 and then in Nehemiah 9-7, but both times it is clarified that Abraham is being referred to. What does it look like when God changes Sarai's name to Sarah? Genesis 17, 15-16 says, And God said to Abraham, as for your wife Sarai, you shall not call her Sarai, but her name shall be Sarah. I will bless her. Indeed, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she shall give rise to nations. Rulers of people shall issue from her. Like for Abraham, God explicitly says Sarai will no longer be called Sarai and explicitly says her name shall now be Sarah. She is never again referred to as Sarai throughout the rest of scripture and only referred to as Sarah from this point. Forward. When God changes someone's name, Scripture explicitly says so. Now that we know what it looks like when God changes someone's name, let's see if this is what happened to Paul when he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus in Acts 9 and when the Holy Spirit speaks about him in Acts 13. Acts 9, 4 through 6 says, And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. What do we see? We see Yeshua call Paul Saul. More importantly, what do we not see? We do not see Yeshua say, you shall be named Paul, nor do we see, you shall no longer be called Saul. There is nothing that can even be construed here as a name change. 
After this encounter with Jesus, Saul experiences blindness for three days and fasts while he is trying to figure out what just happened. In the meantime, Yeshua appears to a disciple named Ananias and gives him instruction regarding Saul in Acts 9, 10 through 12. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Jesus still refers to Saul as Saul here, not Paul. What about when the Holy Spirit talks about Paul after he becomes a follower of Yeshua? Acts 13, 2-3 says, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. This would be the perfect place to find evidence for a name change. The very place John MacArthur says this name change occurred. By this point, Saul has been a follower of Jesus for years, and the Holy Spirit calls him and Barnabas to embark on the God-given mission they're being sent out to do. But instead, we see another instance where God, the Holy Spirit, calls him Saul. Every time God refers to Paul by name in the narrative of Scripture, he calls him Saul. There is no evidence God changed Saul's name. God's name for Paul is Saul. So, when is Saul finally referred to as Paul in Scripture? Saul is finally referred to as Paul in Acts 13, 9. So let's take a look, starting in verse 6 and reading through verse 10. When they had gone through the whole island, as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Scripture explicitly says, Saul, who was also called Paul. Ironically, Saul is still primarily referred to as Saul. In the first sentence, he is referred to as Paul. It is clear that Paul simply has multiple names, which has always been a very common Jewish practice, especially when living or working in a non-Hebrew-speaking country or environment. Similar to how it is the case today, it was the case in the ancient world as well. Here are other biblical examples of this taking place. In Esther 2.7, we see that Hadassah is also called Esther, Hadassah being her Jewish name and Esther being her Greek name, which makes sense given she lived in the Babylonian Empire. In the Greek and Latin-speaking Roman Empire, we find many examples of Jewish people with Greek or Latin names. In John 11, 16, Thomas is also called Didymus. Thomas is Aramaic and Didymus is Greek, both meaning the twin. In Acts 9, 36, we see that Tabitha also has the Greek name Dorcas, which both translate to mean gazelle. In Acts 1, 23, We find Joseph, called Barsabas, also called Justice. He has three names. In Acts 12.12, we find John, called Mark. In Colossians 4.11, we find Jesus, called Justice. And this wasn't only the case with people either. Places also had multiple proper names based on the language of those speaking. For example, John 19.17 says, And Jesus went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Another great example is found in Deuteronomy 3, 8 through 9, which says, So we took the land at that time out of the hand of the two kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan, from the valley of the Arnon to Mount Hermon. The Sidonians called Hermon Sirion, while the Amorites call it Sinir. Having multiple names in multiple languages in a multilinguistic environment was all too common and is all too natural. What else would you expect other than having multiple names? Paul is solely referred to as Paul for the first time in Acts 13.13 13, 
and from that point forward, Paul is exclusively referred to as Paul throughout the book of Acts and only refers to himself as Paul in all of his letters. So what should we make of Paul only being referred to as Paul after Acts 13.9? Why might Luke make this shift? Renowned New Testament scholar Dr. Craig Keener says in his three-volume Acts commentary, At this point, Luke clarifies that his protagonist Saul is also called Paul, a Roman name. This is an alternative name, not a new one. Double names were common. Saul was not a name that would have served Paul well in his mission among Gentiles, the vast majority of whom neither knew nor cared about his ancestral Benjaminite king. In Greek, salas meant conceited or effeminate, the cognate verb suggesting walking in an effeminate manner. But the primary reason for Luke's transition at this point is that Paul's ministry to Gentiles begins here, inviting Paul, as well as Luke, to shift to emphasis on his Roman name. Luke shifts usage of Saul to Paul because this is when Paul's mission shifts to the Gentiles and possibly because his Hebrew name could have been rhetorically problematic to the Greek ear, and Paul would simply use his Greek name for his Greek-speaking audience. And this is not a new interpretation in the Christian commentary tradition. In our earliest surviving commentary on Romans, written in the mid-250s AD, Origen writes, It appears to us that Paul also used two names, and while he was ministering to his own people, he was called Saul, because it seemed more colloquial to his native country. But he was called Paul when composing laws and precepts for the Greeks and Gentiles. For the scripture that says, Saul, who was also called Paul, shows very plainly that he is not being designated Paul there for the first time, but rather this has been an old designation. So now we know what name changes look like in the Bible, and we know that many biblical characters went by multiple names, especially when in complex cultural and linguistic settings. When we read the story of Paul's turn to Messiah Yeshua, we do not see a dramatic name change symbolizing his abandonment of Judaism and turn to Christianity. Saul always had multiple names because he was a Jew who lived in Latin and Greek-speaking Rome. He was a sinful Jew who repented and committed his Jewish life to the Jewish Messiah as a Jew with multiple names. If you learned something new, please subscribe to the channel and share the video or podcast with a friend. If you'd like to support us, you can find links to our PayPal and subscribe to our page in the description. Thank you for joining me today and see you next time.